Welcome to the Tuesday edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 679. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is August 10th, 2021. All right, welcome to the Tuesday show. We're glad you're here to join us. There's a lot to talk about. I got about six or seven stories over here in the show notes, which, hey, I'll just show you real quick because I added this little feature to our show. I, I hope you saw that <laughs> real quick. Now, as you guys know, we always start off with a good, good news story, but before we do that, sometimes we have weather reports. We used to do that all the time in the, in the 300, George. We'd sit down and say, how's the weather in Florida? Oh, it's really hot, Kevin. Well, I can say for a fact, today it's going to be 94 degrees in Madison, Wisconsin, with 98% humidity. That's that's Florida weather. That's Lacantle August weather, George. How's it down there today? <laughs> oh, it's lovely. And even if it were lightning and thunder and tornadoes, it's wonderful because school has started. Uh -huh. Our schools, public and private, began their uh, fall semester on Monday. And in this part, and in Florida, the children are in-person schools without masks. The governor has uh, issued an executive order saying that uh, it is the parents who decide whether the child wears a mask or not, not the school district, not the county commissioners. So uh, a blow for personal liberties and freedom uh, and getting the kids out of the house after the COVID lockdowns of the last year. It's interesting. Here in the Midwest, we have strong teachers unions. You've heard of the Chicago teachers unions and stuff like that. They refuse to go back to school uh, unless the kids are fully masked, double masked, vaccinated, um, and can prove you know through tests that they're not infected. And Chicago, a, that's a... They're not going back to school until 2025, yeah, as far as I can tell through the press. Uh, we are relocating the camper. We're going to take Monstro up to Elkhart Lake on uh, Sunday. That's closer to Green Bay. I don't know if I've ever alluded to this before, but my spouse, Jill, is a fan of the Green Bay Packers. That's a, a pro football team here in America for our foreign viewers. And we uh, have bought tickets to go to a preseason game sometime in the next week or two, which will be a lot of fun. And we're going to close out our time up there and come back and visit Mom and Dad again before we head maybe west to uh, South Dakota in the Badlands. We have not determined our full schedule yet. So that's what's happening with us. We're going to continue the tradition, George. Number one story, a good news story. Now, from time to time, not it's not so infrequent that I would call it rare, but we get to report on archaeological finds. Um, and every time we f we report on something they find in Israel or the the Middle East area, it confirms the narrative of Scripture. There's nothing that ever debunks anything, uh, New Testament or Old Testament. And once again, we find that uh, a story in the Bible all the way back to uh, 768 BCE has been confirmed by the finds of archaeologists in Israel. And I'm like, yeah, we're all the way back to Amos now, George. You will flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. That's Zechariah 14, verse 5. The Israeli Antiquities Authority announced today that they have found evidence of this earthquake that took place during the time of Isaiah and is recorded in Amos chapter 1 and is referenced in other portions of the Old Testament. The Antiquities Authority uh, released a press statement and a video which we posted on Anglican Inc. Uh, saying that uh, they had discovered uh, some crushed uh, pottery and balls that had come down and but there was no fire uh, or there were no elements to show that this was the sacking or destruction of, of the city and there's no record of that having taken place but what there was a record of was an earthquake and using scientific methods uh, they were able to basically determine yes this is earthquake destruction and by the pottery shards yes this is from the time of King Isaiah and lo and behold, 
the Bible narrative is true. I don't think there's been a case where the Bible narrative has been shown to be false. There are many things that we can't prove took place. I don't think we'll find archaeological evidence that the Red Sea parted. Maybe not yet, but every, you know, it's a throwaway line in Amos 1. It's a, it's a reference in Zechariah 14. You will flee as you fled in the time of the earthquake in Isaiah's days. Well, there was such an earthquake. And folks, the Bible is true. Spiritually, it's true. And its narrative is true. Mm -hmm. And I just find that so exciting. I, I do too. I mean, I remember having conversations. Well, Kevin, you don't really believe Noah's Ark, that the whole world was flooded, that, in, you know, scientifically, we don't have enough water to completely. I, no, I get it. Scientifically, we don't have enough water to flood the earth. I'm not doing this based on just science. I'm doing this based on a understanding of the spiritual realm of the god i worship who created it and if he wants to change it or flood it or destroy it he can uh anytime he wants and uh i i don't in my mind have to prove everything in scripture i do find much encouragement when i find archaeologists confirming the narrative of historical scripture that the, the, nothing has the, ever been debunked and for me popular. that increases my faith I'm sorry for interrupting. Right. One of the popular, uh, we've got a slow connection, so sometimes we don't know when the other is quite done. Uh, one of the popular uh, theories in biblical history in the first part of the 20th century was that the Bible was written after the fact. It was written by people who weren't there. It was written to sort of justify the past. Uh, it's a novel and a sort of a mythical just the way Paul Bunyan is in the United States, uh, or George Washington in the cherry tree, all after the fact uh, things. What this tells us is that Amos contemporaneously wrote about the earthquake. In other words, this is something if it was written 300, 400 years later by somebody else, you would not add in that particular line. And what it's demonstrating is that Amos wrote Amos, not somebody 300 years later, not somebody 500 years later uh, trying to uh, uh, sort of tie together a mythical history. But the Bible is trustworthy and true on a spiritual and I believe on a historical level. And um, as we're referring to on a minor character level, archaeologists will tell you all the time what surprises the most is the minor characters in scripture and in the old testament that are being confirmed they're like well we never thought we'd get this family confirmed you know it's it's some strange thing out of leviticus you know and like well whoa, whoa there it is so no i agree it, it's nice to see that it's encouraging to my faith it's nice to report on and it made the good news story of the day on anglican unscripted yay george let's move on to some other news we always follow the good news story with Church of England news. Kind of the, that contrasting. All good, weird, bad, ah. So let's go on and I have, ooh, Save the Parish campaign. Let's talk about that a little bit, George. A general synod a few weeks ago uh, announced, a, announced a plan to start 10 to 20,000 new congregations that could meet in Chinese restaurants mm -hmm. or in movie theaters or uh, or in people's homes. And that would be led by lay people. And this has received a great deal of pushback. And the pushback is coming because this is another top-down plan uh, done by the bishops and the Archbishop's Council and the smart people in London who are telling the rest of England what to do. and. This is getting pushed back from the clergy because the clergy are saying, now I'm repeating their arguments, that the parish system is the bedrock of the Church of England. You know where you can get baptized, married, and buried. And if you're going to allow, uh, if you're going to put money from the Church of England into having 
a congregation open up in a Chinese restaurant across the street from the church, what you're doing is you're not adding another congregation, you're taking away from the parish system. So you should invest in the parish system, make them stronger, more reactive to the needs of people, rather than abandoning something that's been there 1,500 years. Um, and there are, I believe there is merit in a great deal of that argument uh, that people, most people in England, um, Kevin, you had uh, somebody on the show once who described the yeah. Church of England as a public. Uh, Gerald Bray, I did an interview with him a couple of years ago. He said, you know, I, I understand North Americans getting really excited about Anglicanism and how it works within the Church of England. But most, you know, people in England, in Britain, consider the Church of England more like a public library. It's where you go to get your baptism. It's where you go for your funeral. Um, it's, it's where you go for your wedding. It's not like you guys see as this great evangelical force overtaking the shores of Britain. I said, well, that's disappointing. Well, no, that's just the reality. You know, the, the Brits use the Church of England different than, than we do, but it's a historic, it's a, a place where they know is always there. And to that, there is some merit, George. And the Save the Parish campaigners are protesting essentially jettisoning that mm -hmm. in place of something that seems fantastical. 20, 000, 10 thousand parishes in England, I think, or four, some number in the sure. in the uh, uh, four digits. And to say, well, I'm going to add 20,000 more uh, without edu theological education, without safeguarding, without, you know, financial oversight. Yeah, it doesn't <laughs> seem likely. But I can also uh, see the enthusiasm of the people who want to start new groups of worshipers that are not tied to what may be a dead and decaying parish with a priest who doesn't believe and a congregation who views it as a, as a public library. Well, and that's what I asked this question is, is a church that's only seen as a public library working? You know, is this new church planting or this new... Um, uh, home group type thing planting uh, a replacement for something that's working or not working so that would be my point now George imagine one day you open up the New York Times and you see Bernie Sanders just wrapped in the American flag and in his hand he has the the communist manifesto but he has a a, a lighter under it he's just he's burning the communist manifesto well that's American patriotism. That's, you know, that's something that would be very odd to see somebody like Bernie Sanders, a, a socialist here in America, by all means. Uh, you just don't see that that often. It's strange. It makes the news. And by golly, the Archbishop of York made the news for being an English-British patriot this week, George. I was surprised. In journalism, we call this a man bites dog story. It's unexpected. It's against character. Yes. In last Saturday's Telegraph, Stephen Cottrell, or Cottrell, depending if you have an American or English pronunciation, published an opinion piece celebrating Englishness. It was a, basically a call to English nationalism, where it's applauded to be a Welsh nationalist or a Scottish nationalist but the London elites look down on people who are English nationalists. And we are a country uh, where the London elites basically run the show for the rest of us in the hinterlands, yet our England is, is, has a religious ethos, it has a cultural ethos, it has a spiritual ethos that the elites are seeking either to dismantle or ignore. And this had some very, Nigel Farage, who's the uh, conservative uh, politician, mm -hmm. now he's a commentator on cable television, both in the US and in England, uh, said, you know, I can't believe it. I'm so happy the Archbishop of York has finally said something I can agree with wholeheartedly. But at the same time, there's been a little bit of pushback. Our, our friend Gavin Ashenden was interviewed and spoke on this for the GB this, the new cable news channel in England. And Gavin voiced some concerns of right message, wrong messenger. 
Absolutely true. And in the Times, Trevor Phillips, who is a uh, prominent, uh, he's not a Church of England, I, but he's somebody well known in the church world there, wrote that uh, really, you physician heal thyself because you, Stephen Cottrell, are one of the high priests of wokeness. And wokeness is fundamentally anti English. And now you're coming out with uh, English patriotism as a good, where wokeness, which you're also pushing, is the other good. And the two just don't go together. So it, Cottrell is sort of filling a void left by Justin Welby, uh, who's on sabbatical, but has been a, there's been a void for a number of years now. And I have to ask myself, what prompted Cottrell to take this action? Because it was really politically astute. It was really smart. But yes. Is, but is his uh, persona so damaged by his wokeness that it won't won't matter? Well, when we say wokeness, you know, England, Britain, is the original colonial colon, you know, setting out uh, the white man upon the earth, <laughs> the disease of whiteness uh, upon the earth. And so it's it's interesting to see this. I'm glad to see it. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with a a love for your country, uh, a love for where you uh, are, are born, a, a love for the people you are with in, in the nation uh, that you find yourself. I, there's nothing wrong with patriotism. Well, how do you... But the question I would put to Stephen Cottrell is how do you square your support for Black Lives Matter and tearing down all the statues of uh, historic English men and women, uh, even just tearing down a statue or a painting of Queen Elizabeth uh, against a call to English nationalism and patriotism. What will actually is that nationalism patriotism going to look like when it's okay for an Oxford College Commons room to jettison the portrait of the Queen because it is a trigger point for some people? Yeah, didn't mention that in his article. <laughs> So, no, it should be. I I, I want to see how this plays out over the next couple of uh, uh, weeks. Um, I'm glad to see it. I'm glad that uh, his article was sound, uh, unlike some of the other stuff we've read from him. So, yeah, I I'm not going to complain too much about the messenger. So we've seen many times, especially in the Bible, the messenger was always flawed. Okay, so just putting that out there. He could be a <laughs> Stephen Cortell would be a, a wonderful flawed biblical character. Uh, also in the news is that our first? That's our two English stories. So we covered the bad news. Uh, we're going down under, George. We're going to go down to Australia, where it's currently winter time. This is the the throes of winter down there, and we have two stories. One from the diocese of Newcastle, which the bishop announced will allow same sex blessings. And this is that step into the slippery slope. We saw it here in America. We saw it in Canada. We've seen it in uh, many Western provinces around the world. It, all we want to do is have a, a pastoral ministry to people who suffer from same-sex attraction. Can't we just allow for a blessing? No, that's all we want. That's that, we'll stop right there. It never stops, George. Diocese of Newcastle is just to the north northeast of uh, Sydney. It's in the same uh, New, Th New South Wales province, but it's very different um, for a foreigner uh, who only sees occasional news about the Anglican Church of Australia. Newcastle is the snake bit diocese. It seemed to be the epicenter of the clergy abuse crisis. That's where its former arch, uh, the Archbishop. Uh, uh, They've lost two or three bishops over a cover-up of abuse. Mm -hmm. um, the The dean of the cathedral there was jailed for abusing uh, young boys, and he was on the uh, synod task force that uh, wrote the abuse guidelines. Uh, it's led the way in women priests, and now it's leading the way in same-sex blessings. And it's doing it by sort of a backhanded way, where in a pastoral letter to the clergy, Bishop Peter Stewart, is relaxing the ban on same-sex blessings. So how does that play out? He's not saying you can have same-sex weddings, but what he is saying if a gay couple can have a same-sex blessing. So we're back in the United 
<clears throat> in Episcopal Church history, we're back to about 1995, where people would say on the left, we don't want gay marriage. That's an impossibility. Marriage is between a man and women. Everybody on the left said that, with one or two exceptions. Mm -hmm. We just want a blessing of an existing relationship to show God's love is there. And, of course, we started there, and where did we wind up? Bill Love being tossed out of the church for not allowing gay weddings. Uh, so Peter Stewart knows the, has the American game book, uh, playbook, and is starting down that road for his diocese. And because Australia is decentralized, he can pretty well do what, pretty much what he wants so long as he is careful to say, I'm lifting my ban on something, not specifically authorizing you to do so. Well, and just like the Episcopal Church, the, the Episcopal Church rules, General Convention, never allowed for it back in the, in the 90s. Um, you, you had to go outside the canons, you had to go outside the rules and the bylaws of the church in order to do this. Soon, the bylaws and canons within the church, well, within a, a two decades, would slowly catch up to that, uh, which we find now with the, the General Convention. And I think that's the same game plan here in Australia. We're just going to go outside the rules a little bit to offer pastoral care. What on earth could go wrong in hopes that everything will go wrong and that the, the canons of the church will change. And it's called the slippery slope. We've seen it every time this is applied, George. We just want one little step. And we have the other portion of the American playbook uh, unfolding in Melbourne where Peter Freer, who's the former Archbishop of Australia and the current Archbishop of Melbourne, has condemned Gafcon's plan for a non-geographic diocese akin to the one in New Zealand for those in dioceses like Newcastle that can't take gay blessings. And Archbishop Philip Freer, uh, you, Kevin and I met him in, uh, King, mm -hmm. in Kingston, Jamaica. When was that? Uh, a long time ago, 2009. Well, okay. Yeah. Well, we ago. met him. Uh, this is when the uh, Anglican Communion Covenant was underway. And Freer is a decent fellow and personally holds a traditional view, but on human sexuality. But more strongly, the view that he holds more strongly is the unity of the church. So Freer will tolerate le liberal innovations, but he will then smack down conservatives who want to break up the show because they can't live with the liberal innovations. So Freer uh, wrote a letter, uh, a pastoral letter to his diocese saying, I don't like this GAFCON, non-geographic diocese. Unity is more important. And then he went on to say that something that really steamed some of the Sydney people, David Old, uh, in a piece that we printed on Anglican Inc. pointed this out, that he said, maybe this is a sneaky way to escape uh, the uh, liability for the sex abuse claims that the church has had to pay over the years because if you leave and form your own new little breakaway church you're not legally liable which i don't think has been in the mind of any of the gafcon people of far from it they seem to have gone overboard uh by playing fair in these issues when the problem has not arisen in the gafcon areas except for Tasmania, of course, but yeah. that has a new bishop that has been cleaning house. So it, it was an unfair jibe by Freer, but it was, but it was the American playbook of yeah, that's a, bishops yeah. who personally are conservative, but will allow the church to go direction. Uh, John Allen was the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church when I started off my journey, and he was against women bishops, but he would not, uh, women clergy, but mm -hmm. he would not stand in the way of the ch people who wanted them because he valued the church more than he valued. And John Allen told this to me and a bunch of seminarians when he visited uh, our divinity school, uh, that if he looked back on his life, the prob his greatest sin was worshiping the church, not worshiping Jesus Christ. And I don't want to put those words in uh, Philip Freer's mouth, but I think uh, he would be guilty of the same thing. Well, we've seen this throughout history. People idolize the the smells and bells. They idolize, uh, you know, the church, the you know, the creeds more than 
other things that are important. God. And uh, it's not a mistake that won't occur again. I'm just, you know, I'll put that out there. And I met uh, current bishops that I that are more idolizing of things that are not of God. I, I don't know how to say that without naming names. Okay, George, um, we talked about a story last week. It was the headline story. There was a new women, women, woman bishop in Kenya. Uh, it got a lot of play on Anglican Inc. this week. I got a lot of play on Anglican Scripted. Mostly because we talked about the moratorium. We said, you know, Gafcon said there's a moratorium not on women clergy, but on having women in the role of the Episcopate. And it was agreed upon from day one when they're signing the Jerusalem Declaration. Uh, yeah, we're not going to have that um, until at one point in time, all of GAFCON agrees to it. Until then, we're just going to have a moratorium. Uh, it was unofficial for the first years, and then they've kind of put it in writing, and they've been honoring that moratorium every time the leaders get together. We reaffirm the moratorium. And that happened as recently as 2019 which in my calendar here is two years ago. We were told by the press office of GAFCON when we inquired about, well, how can there be a woman to the Episcopate in Kenya if there's a moratorium? And we were told there was a sunset clause. We refuted any knowledge of a sunset clause in last week's show, just short of calling out BS. <laughs> I didn't want to go that far, just in case it was. We've done some more research this week, George, and let's let's further the story. Was there a, a sunset clause to the moratorium? And what story are we getting? And are, are we being BS'd? Yes. Okay. We are. Um, and I don't know whether it's through ignorance or malice. Um, in the original GAFCON moratorium on women in the Episcopate was issued following the meeting of the primates where they discussed the uh, uh, ordination of uh, a Sudanese, South Sudanese assistant bishop. The primates agreed and that was the moratorium. A commission was set up, uh, chaired by uh, Stephen Knoll was a major part of it and it was led by a Kenyan bishop uh, that basically did a great deal of work in this area, wrote studies and reports. Funny, nobody told them there was a moratorium uh, on this, and we. Lo and then, Kevin, you're right. At the 2019 meeting, which our, which the Gafcon press officer told us was the time when the Morian moratorium expired, they the primates reaffirmed it. So, the moratorium is still in place until the next primates meeting. Of GAFCON, which I believe is September. Mm -hmm. So I'm more tempted to think that this is basically ignorance than it is malice because this is such a whopper that I that I don't nobody who was involved in this buys it for a moment. I would new and press if somebody's officer being told this to yeah. repeat this as a press statement, mm -hmm. then they're being manipulated. Yeah. I, and their lack of knowledge is just I chalk it up to maybe a new press officer. Uh, Andrew Gross had stepped aside sometime in the last year. I think they had a, a gap time when there's no press officer for GAFCON. That could be it. Um, somebody gave this person wrong information. I can't imagine somebody saying, well, let's just tell George and Kevin that there's a sunset clause. <laughs> no, there's not. There's never, you know, they may have discussed it, but, you know, uh, there was no sunset clause. Because we're at the point now where GAFCON insiders who do not, who basically have said, I'm not going to say anything on the record to tear down GAFCON, are basically livid because they have been either misled or there's nobody at the helm of GAFCON who can uh, keep the story straight. And they're not going to go on with the record and tear it down because they've invested their careers and lives in it. Mm -hmm. But at the same point, this came as a is a what uh, moment. What a great opportunity for GAFCON to issue a retraction or a, a new statement or a clarification of the sunset story. Um, 
perhaps the sun rose again the next morning and <laughs> now like, it's still uh, out of there uh, silly story of the day okay we've also talked almost for four or five weeks four weeks now at least about Truro uh, Truro has gone through uh, two priests in a short period of time and uh, they're having some bad internal press and external press and uh, I thought we'd just give a quick update because we've been talking about it and it has made the pages if you follow the comments on Anglican Inc there's a lot of commenting going on we're getting a lot of emails from the vestry and some other people and we want to be sure that our story is straight as to what we know so that the audience many of you who you know go to Truro have all the facts straight so George what is the latest update August 8th, they had the parish meeting where they discussed what happened. Vestry made a presentation. A lot of it was uh, already printed in the emails to the congregation, then a short question and answer period. Um, what, what I am experiencing and what Kevin and this, what we are experiencing is that there seems to be a population at Truro who feels that they're being choked off from commenting so they come to us and they say stuff to us and there's some flashpoints right now one flashpoint is mary hayes the new interim priest mary hayes is a lovely person i'm not I saying know anything her. against I her i love her yes absolutely but what we're being told and i'm just reporting what i'm being told is mm -hmm. that mary hayes was sent by the diocese after tori balcom came to sort of walk them through their path of healing and was the one who turned over complaints about Tim Mayfield to John Guernsey. So what is getting sent into my inbox is Mary Hayes was the the man from the head office, the woman from the head office who wound up with the job of the person she uh, was sent to uh, get rid of. Uh, I don't know if that's a I don't think that may be fair or not, I don't think but so. for a portion of the congregation, having an interim rector as someone who was part of the, the team that got rid of the past interim rector is very, very alienating, mm -hmm. um, as is a lack of uh, real communication, which is more than just press releases going one way, it's hearing things both ways. Another allegation that has been given to us is that while the accusers were given full and free voice and reign, uh, Tim Mayfield was never really consulted. Um, this, In other words, the analogy that's being shared with me is the Andrew Cuomo affair. Now, whether you like Cuomo or not, uh, the Attorney General of New York violated the law on what she did because she did an investigation that only talked to the witness on one side she never w talked to Cuomo and then said, well, I find nothing wrong here, and but dumped all the bad information that could never be cross-examined, never be tested in a court of law on Cuomo without his right of reply. And what is being said to me is that Tim Mayfield basically has been given the same thing, that Tim Mayfield wrote a, refuted these in detail and that they claim was never considered or never discussed within the vestry or at the higher up levels. I don't know this, but the, the the task of the parish of Truro is being made harder of pulling it all together again when you have people coming to third parties like us to be the place where they vent their anger. Yeah. One of the things, and I remember talking about this in a kind of off the record sense with Bishop Murnock many years ago, he says, you know, what you really would need to understand is having the perfect doctrine will not make a perfect church. You know, all these wars and fights we're going through, trying to, to, to look for an ivory church somewhere, doesn't necessarily make church easier. You're still going to go through all the struggles. And these are the struggles. These are the human struggles that happen at the GAFCON level, the miscommunication, the, you know, the th you know, you got the right doctrine. You're doing the you know, the canons are right. Your belief is right. Your your Nicene Creed is right. Everything there is right. But church is hard. What we find in the diocese of the the, the uh, upper Midwest here, and I'm here in the diocese of the upper Midwest. Church is hard. You can have a lay person do something wrong, and you try to pastorally handle it, and 
and work within some type of system and it falls apart and church becomes very difficult people are hurt you let go of a a, a priest who you who has been accused of um inappropriate behavior and it's hard it's hard for a church to deal with this even if they have the right doctrines the right nicene creeds and all that this is church at the very human level and we see this with Trill as they struggle through this and i've never seen a church unanimously fire somebody even jimmy swagger when he was fired many years ago had 10 or 12 supporters who stayed on and help him continue the jimmy swagger ministries and you're like wow how does that happen well church is hard and there's the human factor the broken factor of church that's why we don't want to idolize church that's why we don't want to make it an idol you want to make god your idol so mm, i hate to say that so we'll have to see what happens in trill we'll keep just keep them in your prayers this is a struggling time keep gafcon in your prayers keep australia in your prayers and what a great time to pray for the archbishop of york as he seems on a recently new path we'll see george is that all the stories we got for the week anything no no india stories but anything else well we do but i don't yeah we're running out of time they'll pass yeah. our editorial uh buster <laughs> which it's not a high bar <laughs> All right, cool. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Congan. You've been watching episode 679 of Anglican Unscripted.